Thanks very much indeed, Mike, and thank you, Vice-Chancellor. Um, for reasons that you can all um, well understand, I suppose I'm slightly, don't normally get nervous when I'm speaking at all, don't mind who's in the audience. Tonight, though, I think you're testing my limits a little bit with that, <laughs> Brian. Uh, could I uh, also acknowledge the uh, heads of mission in the room, Your Excellencies, uh, also uh, Professor Sally Wheeler and Professor Anna Moore. It's, it's great to be back on campus, I must say, for the second time this week in this lecture theatre, but uh, it, was, it was very good on Tuesday and I'm sure it'll be just as good tonight. I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I think, I'm sure this, I can't, I've, I've thought hard about it, I, I, I want to suggest that the um, indigenous, indigenous Australians may well have the world's oldest continuing cosmology and that of course is another reason for our deep respect. Thank you to the United Nations Association of Australia, ACT Division, and to ANU Centre for International and Public Law for giving me the opportunity this evening to speak about the international dimensions of Australia's growing interest in space. As we mark the beginning of World Space Week, an international celebration of science and technology first declared by the UN General Assembly in 1999, it is fitting that I make my first public remarks as DFAT Secretary on space here at an event organised by the UN Association of Australia, dedicated as it is to work on behalf of the United Nations to promote its aims and ideals. Although I am by no means an expert on space, in preparing this public lecture, I found myself reaching back into my filing cabinet for an earlier speech I made on space. Much earlier, in fact. It was 1991 at the 47th session of the United Nations General Assembly in the Special Political Committee. And I was making a statement as the Australian representative under item 72, international co cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space. Actually, I think I can uh, pull the thing out. This is how we did it then. I've still got it. I was a youngest diplomat, newly promoted to counsellor and speaking for the first time in a multilateral setting on behalf of my country. The setting, the UN, and the subject, the peaceful uses of outer space, made a deep impression on me, so much so that I kept the hard copy and of course there were no soft copies then. The Cold War was over, that year, speaker after speaker in the general debate conveyed a sense of renewed confidence in the United Nations system and its ability to tackle issues of global and regional concern. There was a focus on the role of preventive diplomacy in identifying and diffusing threats to our collective security. It was International Space Year, and on behalf of Australia, I welcome the conclusion after 13 years of negotiations on a set of principles relevant to the use of nuclear power sources in outer space. I made a rather obvious point about there being much still to do to develop international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space and about the need to ensure the benefits were shared by all countries and all peoples. We needed to be alert to the costs as well as the benefits, I said, and we needed to engage in what I called preventive outer space diplomacy. The diplomats among you will know that this was a, a particular focus of that period. Let me now fast forward though to 2018 and make another rather obvious point. As the international agenda becomes more crowded, more complex and more contested, the United Nations only becomes more important to Australia. Australia's interests are strongly served by acting with others to support a rules-based international order. This was a central point in the foreign policy white paper that the Australian government launched last December. But international institutions, with the United Nations at their centre, carry an increasing load. They must grapple with new technologies, engage more participants in international affairs, 
manage new dimensions for rivalry and cooperation, and often they must cope with a renewed intensity in that rivalry. The space agenda certainly bears that out, as I will explain. But of course, space is also a domain, the iconic domain of opportunity and scientific advance. Space arouses awe in some, and for many, wonder at the sheer scale and beauty of the universe, and our temerity in venturing to understand, as Brian Schmidt has done to such stunning effect, and explore it. Yet at the same time, our use of space is becoming an essential part of our everyday business, and increasingly a key to the innovation that will keep Australian businesses internationally competitive. Today, nurturing and protecting our interests in space is core business for the Australian government. I believe it is vital that a wide range of Australians, from science, industry, defence, as well as government agencies, understand our interests in space and how they play into our wider international interests. So I'm very glad to be here with you tonight. I will set out Australia's advantages and growing interests in space and touch on the contribution that Australia's space agency will make to Australia's international interests, including through the power of innovation and inspiration. I will also discuss Australia's international interests in space in the context of the foreign policy agenda that we set out in the white paper. When many Australians think of space, they'll think of The Dish, the Rob Sitch movie from the year 2000. The movie is worth remembering just for the title, a great pun, and for Sam Neill's acting, excellent as always. But it's also a good starting point for our discussion. It tells the story of those Australians at Honeysuckle Creek and Parks who were the first to see Neil Armstrong walk on the moon on the 20th of July, 1969. They helped produce the vision and they helped bring the first moonwalk to the world. Australians were on the front line then, and we still are. Geographically, we are exceptionally well placed to play a leading role in international collaboration on space, and the only continent in the Southern Hemisphere between the vast Indian and Pacific Oceans. Our enormous interior desert is a gift to astronomy, and it will keep on giving as the square kilometre array comes online. Our crystal clear skies are just as useful for near range earth to space communications. We also have the world class science and advanced manufacturing capabilities we need to invent, build and maintain infrastructure and programs. The Australian government is making the most of these advantages. Over the next four years, Geoscience Australia will invest $225 million to test and develop a satellite-based augmentation system with the aim of making reliable positioning data accurate to 10 centimetres available in every corner of Australia. Areas with mobile coverage will have access to positioning data accurate to 3 centimetres. This precision has the, has the potential to benefit every industry and business that needs to move objects well docking an ocean line or a landing a Royal Flying Doctor service plane, helping farmers reduce costs, improving safety on construction and mining sites. Practical people all over the country will use this technology to solve problems and improve the way they do things. This is the lifeblood of innovation and economic growth. Innovation is flourishing in Australia in the space sector itself. We've had a history of grasping opportunities in space. We launched our first satellite from Woomera in 1967 using a Redstone Sparta rocket left over from a combined US, UK and Australia testing program. With this event, Australia became the third nation to launch a satellite from our own territory. The tempo of our space activity is picking up again today. In 2016, Cube Rider, a member of Australia's Delta V Space Alliance, made history by sending the first ever Australian payload to the International Space Station. And last year, a consortium of Australian universities 
launched three Australian-built research CubeSats into orbit. These were Australian-made spacecraft travelling into space, the first since 2002. Importantly, Australians are at the forefront of developing better, more affordable ways to use satellites. CSIRO's $200 million venture capital firm Main Sequence Ventures has invested in a number of space-related startups. One of these, Miriota, founded by two researchers from the University of South Australia, is commercialising satellite technology developed within the university's Institute for Telecommunications Research. It's a great example of an Australian company turning clever technology into a successful business. The company uses small, low-cost transmitters on low-Earth satellites to send small packets of data across an Internet of Things network. The satellites and sensors are then able to talk to one another without the need for expensive infrastructure back here on the ground. With its low cost and long battery life, the company's satellite technology could allow them to apply direct to orbit connectivity on a massive scale. One real world example being trialled would help farmers get up to date information on water tank levels. You drop a sensor in a water tank the data flows from sensor to satellite and then with an app on a phone to a farmer anywhere in Australia who can monitor just how much water is in their tank without having to physically go and check. The company is aiming to reduce the expensive fees of existing satellite technology, bringing real world benefits to working people. Another application is in the field of defence. Last year, Miriota and technology company I Measure You received funding from the government's Next Generation Technologies Fund to develop a wearable black box type flight recorder for the Australian Army. The flight recorders use Miriota's technology for emergency beaconing to help locate and aid injured soldiers. Fully developed, it could also provide benefits for other physically demanding occupations, such as emergency services or law enforcement. Miriota will be launching their commercial direct-to-orbit Internet of Things connectivity, at least the solution related to that, this year. But as their journey so far, from an idea at a university to a technology company that recently raised over $19 million from Boeing shows, the future is bright for Australians engaging in science and innovation in space. Examples like these show why space is core business. State governments are getting behind it, the Space Innovation Fund in South Australia being just one example. In addition to encouraging and nurturing all of this activity and potential, the government is also setting in place the institutions and policies we need to coordinate and protect our interests in space. The centrepiece of these efforts, as many of you will know, is the establishment of an Australian space agency. The agency will be responsible for whole of government coordination of civil space matters and will be the primary source of advice to government on civil space policy. A number of our cities are interested in hosting the agency headquarters, pointing to the significant space resources and capability each of them possess. The Space Agency will drive further innovation across the economy and will complement our defence export strategy. One of its six objectives is to inspire Australians to embrace the potential of space. As an astronomer, before he became a Vice-Chancellor, Brian Schmidt identified that the expansion of the universe was accelerating and won a Nobel Prize. Could there be a more inspiring example for our young scientists? The time is ripe for breakthroughs, just as dramatic in our understanding of how we can use and protect our space environment. Curiosity and the determination to test and advance our thinking is a great source of national strength. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is, is absolutely committed to contestability and innovation in all that we do. Particle physicist Dr Sarah Pearson leads the way as both our Chief Innovation Officer and newly appointed Chief Scientist. 
I'm delighted at the prospect of science and technology, enterprise and innovation becoming a more prominent part of Australia's international profile. A push that is now behind it the rocket fuel of an Australian space agency led by Dr Megan Clark, for which international engagement is a high priority, of course, as it was too for Megan uh, when she was chief executive of CSIRO. In August, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Karen Andrews, signed a memorandum of understanding with the French Space Agency, and the government is in discussions with Canada, the UK, the United States, and the European Space Agency. Just last week, the Australian Space Agency signed a memorandum of strategic intent with the European manufacturing giant Airbus, and yesterday it entered into memoranda of understanding with counterpart agencies in Canada and the United Kingdom. DFAT will liaise closely with the Space Agency in our international engagement on civil space issues, a core part of our wider foreign policy agenda. All nations jealously guard their access to space, and it should come as no surprise that the major powers are jostling for influence in setting the rules. In the face of complexity and uncertainty, as the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper made clear, we must seek opportunity while protecting our interests. A great deal is at stake for Australia, as you've already heard, and it's vital that we protect our access to space. We do this by continuing to strengthen our capabilities through our alliance with the United States and also by strengthening international frameworks and rules for the use of space. In the defence domain, both Australia and the United States benefit from improved space situational awareness by the relocation of significant US surveillance assets, C-band radar from Antigua, and soon the Space Surveillance Telescope from New Mexico to the Harold E. Holt Communication Station in Western Australia. We will need to be more active internationally on space if we are to continue to reap the economic and strategic benefits. As this audience well knows, the outer space environment is changing and it's changing rapidly. Space is democratising and the barriers to accessing space are tumbling as the sector is disrupted by technology that is far cheaper to build, launch and maintain. There's been a large uptick in the number of states that have become spacefaring nations seeking the same societal and economic benefits the established space players have enjoyed almost exclusively. There are approximately now 60 nations and government consortia that own and operate satellites. There are many research and commercial activities developing and deploying micro and small satellites in low Earth orbit. Of course, just like in terrestrial domains, Increased activity poses considerable challenges to the finite resources of the spectrum and the available orbital slots. And more activity, unfortunately, means more space debris, something I described as a new issue in 1991, certainly no longer the case. There are now somewhere in the order of 23,000 man-made objects larger than 10 centimetres in orbit, and over 100 millions of pieces of debris less than one millimetre. Even sub-millimetre debris pose a realistic threat to space-based assets due to the high impact speeds in space. More space debris means rising costs for commercial and civil activities in space, principally through more collision avoidance manoeuvres that in turn reduce the operating lifespan of satellites. Space debris also makes managing orbital traffic more challenging. Without doubt, the most serious causes of space debris are anti-satellite missile tests and on-orbit collisions, which can have strategic consequences. All of this change is occurring under an international framework of treaties that was built in a very different technological and strategic environment. The current legal regime for outer space is based on the five UN space treaties. The most recent, the Moon Agreement, 
dates from the 1980s. Australia is a state party to all five treaties. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty is the cornerstone of the legal regime. It prohibits the placement of weapons of mass destruction in outer space or on celestial bodies. But there are currently few limits on the deployment of conventional weapons in outer space or on ground-based anti-satellite weapons or on activities that directly or indirectly create space debris. It is estimated that China's 2007 test of an anti-satellite missile, which collided with and destroyed a non-operational Chinese weather satellite, generated a cloud of more than 3,000 pieces of debris. This cloud is the largest ever tracked, and much of it will stay in orbit for decades, posing a significant collision threat to outer space to other space objects. For a number of years, efforts have been underway in the United Nations and other fora to build on the current treaty network and enhance the security and stability of outer space. The Conference on Disarmament has a standing agenda item on the prevention of an arms race in outer space, and there is also work in the International Telecommunications Union which oversees orbit registration and bandwidth, and of course the World Meteorological Organization also. But different countries have different and conflicting initiatives and approaches to space security issues. Russia and China are promoting a draft treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space. In the proposal, state parties would commit to refrain from placing objects carrying any type of weapon into orbit, installing weapons on celestial bodies, and threatening to use force against objects in outer space. Russia also promotes the No First Placement Initiative, where countries pledge not to be the first to place weapons in space. Both of these initiatives, though, would provide limited comfort and could have counterproductive consequences by allowing unfettered development of terrestrial and dual-use counter space systems. While Australia is in favour of the prevention of an arms race in outer space, we do not support either of these initiatives. The draft treaty on banning weapons in outer space appears to be at least as much about strategic manoeuvring as meaningful arms control. And there are two fundamental issues with both of these proposals. First, they fail to provide a workable definition of space weapon. Second, they also fail to provide a verification mechanism to determine whether weapons have been placed in space. Any manoeuvrable space object is a potential weapon. In crude terms, they become space battering rams. Some of you may be aware of the US Statement on Space Security at the Conference on Disarmament in August this year. This statement was sharply critical of Russian space-related activity and of Russia's no first placement resolution and its proposed treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space. The US official, Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification and Compliance, Ilim Poblete, called attention to Russia's evolving anti-satellite weapons program, including its announcement of the development of a mobile attack anti-satellite system and deployment of a mobile laser system. Uh, I recall driving on my way to work and listening to uh, that element of her speech because it was, it was run on uh, Fran Kelly's breakfast program. I mean, it, it immediately attracted interest and a number of you may have heard it also. But Assistant Secretary Poblete also referred to detection of unusual manoeuvres by a Russian satellite in October 2017. The Russians claim this manoeuvring was for inspection purposes of other satellites, but Assistant Secretary Poblete claimed it exhibited very abnormal behaviour for such a function and noted the challenges of verification. Poblete did not directly refer to this as a possible test of an orbital anti-satellite weapon. Rather, she emphasised, and I quote, we don't know for certain what it is, and there is no way to verify it, end quote. She said, and I quote again, 
Russian intentions with respect to this satellite were unclear and were obviously a very troubling development, particularly when considered in concert with statements by Russia's Space Force commander that assimilating new prototypes of weapons into Space Force's military units was a main task facing the Aerospace Force Force's space troops." End quote. Australia agrees that there is legitimate doubt and no way to verify the Russian satellite's true purpose. We share US concerns and recognise that we need to work with the US and others to maintain our access to space over the longer term. It is these problems of verification and dual use capability that make credible arms control in outer space such a challenge. Ostensibly, civilian satellites can disguise malign purposes. This raises an obvious question, do we need a treaty? Well, in addressing these and other issues, the question is whether legally binding agreements or the approach Australia and others favour of developing non-binding, norm-building, transparency and confidence-building measures, or TCBMs, offer the best way to enhance space security. Australia has long focused our international engagement on encouraging responsible and peaceful uses of outer space, particularly through the creation of such measures. The value of TCBMs is clear. They provide pragmatic, voluntary actions through which governments can address challenges and share information with the aim of creating mutual understanding and reducing tensions. Over time, states develop habits, patterns and norms of international behaviour. Transparency and confidence building measures do not limit any state's use of outer space for, people's, for peaceful purposes as codified in the Outer Space Treaty. Nor do they impose requirements that might act as a barrier to the space activities of developing countries. On the contrary, transparency and information sharing help preserve the space environment in the interests of all countries. This was recognised in the 2013 report of the UN Group of Governmental Experts on Space, which recommended states work together on TCBMs and build norms of responsible behaviour in space. The 2013 UN Group of Governmental Experts report on TCBMs was agreed by consensus and provides a framework for space safety, security and sustainability that can be used immediately on a voluntary basis. This framework was the basis for our support of the European Union's initiative to develop an international code of conduct for outer space activities, which to our disappointment faltered in New York in July 2015. We know the EU remains optimistic there is a future for this initiative and we remain ready to resume the conversation. The UN's report on TCBMs and the EU's code of conduct are both practical ways forward because they focus on positive behaviours. In contrast, the treaty that China and Russia propose would seek to regulate specific assets, actual objects in space, and here we think lies a minefield of definitional scope and verification issues. To give a practical example, last month a British satellite successfully deployed a net in orbit to demonstrate how to capture space junk. The prosaically named Remove Debris satellite launched its own rapidly spinning CubeSat. Around 20 seconds later, the Remove Debris satellite fired a six-pointed star-shaped net to recapture the CubeSat. Researchers hope the satellite will also test a harpoon designed to spear space junk. While these ex experiments are clearly aimed at tackling the space debris problem, what is to stop this kind of technology being deployed offensively against other space objects? We have to consider these military and strategic implications. But what would we want but, but would we want to limit technology that can help us clean up the space environment? This is potentially what the draft treaty would do. Our view is that it is better to limit bad behaviour in space. A first step is to clarify how international law applies in space. 
There is general agreement among states that international law, including the provisions of the UN Charter, applies to the activities of states in outer space. The applicability of international law is clearly set out in the Outer Space Treaty and has been reiterated consistently in key UN General Assembly resolutions, declarations of states and core treaties relating to outer space. There is a need for further work in this area to facilitate agreement amongst states on how international law applies to state conduct in outer space, which will in turn build transparency and confidence in, in how states behave in outer space. This could eventually culminate, certainly, in a new legal instrument, but there is much important TCM work and norm building work to pave the way. Australia is participating actively in a group of governmental experts on further practical measures for the prevention of an arms race in outer space. And in fact, my colleague Rob McKinnon, who represents Australia in that body, is pleased to see is sitting in the audience. The group has been mandated to consider and make recommendations on substantial elements of an international legally binding instrument on the prevention of an arms race in outer space, including inter alia on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space. Assuming that consensus can be reached, and, and I think Rob is, uh, is optimistic on that score, the group will develop, de deliver its report to the Secretary General next year. Australia is committed to a rules-based global order which extends to space. We want to work with allies and key partners to coordinate positions on challenges and initiatives to ensure the long-term sustainability, safety and security of the outer space domain. We have enhanced our defence cooperation on space with Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States by establishing a partnership through the Combined Space Operations Initiative. This grouping allows for more effective and coordinated use of military space capabilities and better cooperation on for instance, identifying and understanding what objects are in space and protecting our access to vital military space systems. We believe this cooperation will make a significant contribution towards a safer and more secure space environment. As the number of states with an interest in space grows, we need the right rules of the road, as it were. This is the best form of preventive state diplomacy. At least that's what we used to call it. We will continue our collaborative work examining the existing legal framework for outer space and working out how it can best function for current and future needs. So let me conclude by saying that bringing order to the final frontier is an important part of our work to help bring about the kind of peace we want, prosperous, open, inclusive and in which all major powers make a contribution to solving global challenges. Our space research and enterprise is a great statement to the international community that we are a creative, sophisticated, adventurous people, and it's a great boon for our economic growth and the jobs that creates for Australians. Australia is at the forefront in civil uses of space and a champion of sound and strong international relations that protect it. Australia remains flexible and open-minded as we contemplate how best we can contribute to international efforts to ensure the long-term sustainability, stability, safety and security of outer space. It's an important aspect of our overall efforts to strengthen and advance international rules and partnerships that underpin our prosperity and security. So I encourage you all, particularly the students amongst you, to develop and integrate your knowledge of the many ways space matters for Australia. It's exciting, complex and important, and we need many good minds on the job. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary. That was uh, a fantastic uh, presentation, and uh, I guess I could use this opportunity to say that um, not only will part of your speech uh, you'll see reflected in some of our papers coming out, but um, 
As we, most people in this room know, that there's been a real, I think, diplomatic deficit over the last 20 years in Australia. So you can expect the UNAA to now start um, uh, really pushing for more to be going into diplomacy rather than less. And um, obviously with the new frontier, the final frontier, we can't do it with just the resources we've got now adequately. So we need more resources rather than less. So what we'll now do is invite our two discussants to each speak for five minutes each, and then we'll open it for Q&A. So I'm not sure who wants to go first. I think we should start with you, Anna. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm not a lawyer or anyone Um, I had three things to, to reflect on, though. The, the first was a, um, an experience about a year ago where um, I was a member of a team who uh, were answering a call by our VC uh, uh, for the Grand Challenges, called Grand Challenges. And um, uh, this was in asteroid mining. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was led by someone, uh, who, an astronomer up at uh, Mount Stromlo, and he asked if I would be uh, part of this team. And I thought, well, it's, it's grand, and it's, it's a challenge. And so I think I took those two boxes off. And I uh, said, so yeah, let's go for it. And it's Australia and mining and management of remote assets. And so it was very exciting. And when I went into it, I, I, I really saw that this was a technical challenge. I mean, it's, it's, te it's the technical side of it. You know, how do you, you, know, how do you go about this? I mean, uh, which asteroids do you go for? How do you get there? Do you bring things back? Do you, do you mine there? Do you build there? All these questions I thought really was, 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 was the difficult stuff. And a few months later, we, our team, the team got bigger and bigger and we, we added people from, uh, from necessity. From, uh, so uh, people from the School of Law yeah. and from finance on the economic side. And we realized that actually the technical side of it was, not that it was easy, but that wasn't really what frightened us at all. It was more the, uh, well, who owns this? Can you just bring it back? Yeah. And these, in, you know, as a scientist, I was like, well, yeah. it can't be difficult to work out, but of course it is. It's really, yeah. really difficult questions requiring international discussion, substantial international discussion. And so that was the first time about a year ago it really opened my, my eyes to the, importance of um, the legal side of, of, of what, what we do in space and our ambitions now and 50 years into the future and more. Um, and uh, we heard a lot today about implica important implications on the, the security, the defense side of things. And you know, I, I design satellites and so I could, I do it for astronomy and mm -hmm. for, Earth-based uh, applications, but that's easily turned around, and I've got a very good understanding of how easy that would be. Um, but from my experience on the ERG, it was um, the space ERG. We heard so much about just the, on the commercial side the difficulty of startups just really getting to grip with the regulation side of it. So even the defence side, the security side, are put on one side. If we're trying to really grow a space industry here. Australia. Um, this kind of thing is really important. It's really important because there, there are major barriers to anyone trying to do things in space, um, even simple stuff. And so just getting on top of that, getting really clear pathways for anyone um, to achieve uh, what they want to achieve is really important if we want to take seriously growing, growing the industry. Um, and in, in space has changed. It's all about accessibility. The accessibility today is just unbelievable. I have nine launch, free launches through ANU right now, through contacts, no issue whatsoever. It's, that was, you could never imagine that 10 years ago, even 10 years ago. So the accessibility, the, 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 therefore the commercialization mm -hmm. potential of that is, um, is so enticing. So uh, it's really important we, 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 we get this right. And very, and uh, just finally, at ANU, 
we have uh, our strategy for what we're going to be doing in space. I can't say much about it today because I will get told off from my VC. I have to wait until we launch officially in three weeks. But it's very much a, um, a multidisciplinary approach and, and really um, motivated from that experience with the Grand Challenge and seeing the importance of what we can do together, combining many different colleges, many different areas to do things that any one group by itself would find very difficult to do. That's what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moore. Professor Wheeler. So, it's really interesting to see law being welcomed into an arena <laughs> as offering something that is not just um, the technical. You know, so now now science is is the technical. Law law is about uh, technique. Um, so I, I suppose I wanted to reflect on, on the journey that, that space has come from, from, from the sort of foundational treaties which are all couched in, in la very much in the language of, of sovereignty, very much in, in the language of the nation state. Uh, and yet, as the Secretary has said, space is democratising. Um, you know, technology is, is both advancing and, and it's disruptive. Anna spoke about, uh, about there being very few uh, bar barriers to what she had done. Um, and I suppose I would want to posit the question as to whether barriers are necessarily a, uh, a, a good thing or, or a bad thing, because I think what we're trying to capture in, in terms of a, of a rules-based order is some idea of, of the values and norms. You know, we've got competing perspectives here between a sense of sort of nation-state competitiveness and of wanting Australian businesses to be, to be at the forefront of what's going on. But we also need some idea of what responsible innovation is. Uh, and obviously there, there's, a, there's a, a disadvantage here to being the, 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 the first mover. But if we can't get to a position where all states embrace some idea of responsible innovation and what is acceptable for space exploration and, and, and what isn't, we're going to be in a very difficult position. And if you look at UNCITRAL, their resources in terms, of, in terms of time, in terms of expertise, they're not going to be in a position to produce anything in, in terms of, a, of a, a, an order that regulates what private interests may or may not do in space anytime soon. The, the, the treaties, uh, certainly uh, what we refer to as the Outer Space Treaty, um, is couched in, in the language of this idea of, of there being a, a common benefit to, to humanity. Um, that treaty doesn't have that many signatories, and it, it doesn't really settle the, what is, the, for me, the core question between national sovereignty and appropriation of, of, of resources. So we already have at least two states, both the US and, and, the, and Luxembourg, that are, the US has it, um, Luxembourg is preparing it, the UE, uh, United Arab Emirates, UEA, is talking about legislation which essentially allows businesses incorporated in their jurisdictions to keep what they mine from space as it, as it being theirs. Now, I spent my first holiday weekend uh, in Australia last weekend in Eden, uh, and I visited the, the Killer Whale Museum. There were five, uh, in, in that bay, there were, there were five companies, private companies, that all pursued uh, what they called shore-based whaling. So I had visions of five boats hurtling out there. And actually, that turned out to be right, because the person who claimed the whale was the person who got the first harpoon on. Now, uh, in the absence of, of any clear regulatory structure, that's going to be exactly what happens to asteroid mining and to water resources on the moon, for example. We will be in the position that the first person who gets there keeps it. With private entities then using state-based, national-based systems of tort and contract to work out what happens in the event of collisions and possibly resorting to international law uh, as maybe an, a way of avoiding liability. So, for me, national state security and exploitation of space is important, but actually, in many ways, the real game is around capturing private entities and pulling private entities 
into a responsible innovation space so that exploration and exploitation takes place in some sort of ordered form. Thank you very much. Um, well, there's a lot of food for thought, I think, with, uh, with those two uh, presentations. And what we'll now do is open it for Q&A. We've got one travelling microphone here, I think. And so we might take, say, three questions at a time. And uh, if we can get an initial person to volunteer, there's one right there in, in the moment, uh, in the middle. And if you could um, just say who you are and who you represent. And could I just say that um, what fills me with great optimism is the fact that we've got three females here tonight. That gives me some hope for the future. <laughs> Please. Uh, hi, Duncan Blake is my name. Um, a number of different hats. I'm a PhD law student at the University of Adelaide and managing editor of the Woomera Manual. Um, the, but my question, I've got ton of questions, I have to sort of choose which one. But my first relates to points that Professor Sally Wheeler made. And that is um, the, the success, the, the, the relative boom in the space industry now is being undeniably driven by a commercial impetus. And in fact, uh, Megan Clark said that over in Bremen at the International Astronautical Congress said that this Australian Space Agency will be perhaps the most commercially focused agency of any, of any agency worldwide. Is there a tension with broader national goals about being a good global citizen and to use space responsibly? Okay, good. That's one question. Do you want me to answer that? Or? Just take it well, on. We'll take three questions. You'll have to remind me what it is, though. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's all right. You, you're talented. You're a mother. <laughs> Who? Another question? The back there. Hi, Jan Murphy from the Parliamentary Library Law Section. Um, this direct talk to the uh, Secretary and Professor Wheeler predominantly, no, no offence Professor Anna, but to what extent do you think, if any, emerging international norms, for example in relation to deep sea mining, the regulation of that outside coastal waters, exclusive economic zones, may shape the exploitation of resources in outer space? Mm -hmm. one. Vice-Chancellor, <laughs> I hope you have time to uh, hear the answer. <laughs> this is a university. Uh, so I guess one of the things I want us to contemplate is technology is running away from us very, very quickly. And this is one of probably for all three of you. And so, Anna, you may want to think about exactly what technology is going to bring in the next five to ten years, which I think will involve large numbers of small, almost uncontrolled satellites. There are gonna be problems. Uh, we may well start exploiting uh, asteroids and things very quickly before any rules-based order is in place. How are we gonna deal with the runaway of technology getting way out in front of the law? Because you guys are trying to get in front yeah. of it. You've already lost the race. Yeah. So how's that gonna emerge? Okay, three great questions. Uh, first one on commercial versus um, global, I suppose, interests. The next one on um, impact of, on deep sea mining and on resources. And the last one on technological advances, perhaps outstripping the rules-based international order to cope with it. So, after you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do those in reverse order yeah. then. Okay, so the first one, law always plays catch up. Once you're beyond very broad general principles, you're, you're always going to play catch up. If you look at the, the global financial crisis, a lot of that was around regulation playing catch up with the development of algorithms. So, so even regulating railways and canals in the 1850s, law played catch up. That's, that's always going to happen. And what you need is the mechanism that enables you to catch up. 
rather than the actual, actual detailed law. Um, around deep sea mining outside territorial waters, I'm not sure how useful that is as an analogy for space, in the sense that space is on a scale that is so much bigger. Uh, there's also, the, I, I, I suspect that the problem of debris and environmental damage is more difficult than deep sea mining. And I'm just a little reluctant to analogize from what is a big but confined space to a space that is so much bigger, if you forgive the pun on, on space. Um, uh, in relation to the first question, yes, there, I think there is a huge tension there. And I, I think there is also a huge tension vis-a-vis -vis the position of developed nations versus developing nations as well. I think it's very, very difficult. And I, the, the sooner we have these conversations around what responsible innovation in this area looks like, the better. I mean, there, there are lots of other areas where responsibility is difficult. I mean, gene therapy being, being one. Uh, nanotechnology being being another. It's not impossible to have these conversations, but it is interesting that this conversation has taken so long to happen. Yeah. Anna? Oh, I didn't really have much to add to that at all. I mean, the um, on the technical side of it, the answer is of course it's accelerating. I mean, um, I mean that you know it, it's not straightforward to, I mean, the, there, is an, there is a infrastructure there right now, a set of rules to do with ITAR and export, and export, mm. you know, controlled technology. You can't just, you know, you can't just, you know, put an infrared array or a, I, even something as innocuous as that on a satellite and, the, and then be able to launch it. I mean, the, the, there is a, a, a pretty regulated system right now. Um, uh, which, which is in existence, but if, if there is a technology or something developed within a, within a nation, they, they can do whatever they, whatever they want with it, that's quite true. Um, but, um, but you're right, I mean, I, I'm, you know, because I am someone who, who builds instruments, and I mean, I'm just really, I'm so excited about the possibility, so, so yes, you're absolutely right, that the, the ideas and the, um, the possibilities now, given what they were in the past, are absolutely huge, and they are just really are accelerating, and, I don't know how the legal side of it actually catches up ever. But, but, that's, but, 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 but knowing it's there, I suppose, is a good start. But, 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 but don't, don't let's think of law just as, as, a, as a system, a system of, of rules. Let's think of it very much more about values and um, um, principles. I mean, the EU has lots of uh, ideas, policies, uh, regulations around the principle of responsible innovation that it uses uh, in, in relation to... Uh, science development generally. So, so it is possible to think around how we, how we might govern these things. I'm very keen that we don't see law just as a syst uh, binary system of you can do this but not do that. Yeah. If I could just perhaps add, um, and the beauty of the panel arrangement is going to be that we, we can sort of complement each other and pick and choose, and, and I'm conscious that the sum total of the expertise on this subject does not reside on this side of the table. I know because I recognise some familiar faces in the audience that there's a lot of expertise on that side of the table. So we might actually permit, uh, with your indulgence, sure, some, some comments as well as questions, because I am conscious of that expertise. Mm. The, the broader point I wanted to make really was in relation to you know, the rules-based order, and, and you, you've got a publication here that I'm sure, Mike, you'll be wanting people to perhaps take copies of the, on the way out, the UN and the rules-based international order. Now, there's a big broader debate going on, including in foreign policy, about even the existence, mm. if you like, of you know, a, let alone the, rules-based order. Um, and one of the reasons we put quite a bit of uh, onus on it in the foreign policy white paper, and it's there in the 2016 defence white paper, is for a, because for a country like Australia, the world's you know, 14th largest economy, um, we can't create order through power, we simply don't have it. We need to rely on rules. But whether rules are norms or, or sort of patterns of good behaviour or you know, whether it's responsible innovation or whether it is in fact uh, through binding treaties, of course there are many, uh, many possibilities along that spectrum. We are facing a number of challenges, if you like, uh, in relation to uh, order and that is 
the post-Second World War order and its, its fitness for even the current challenges, as well as you know, emerging actors who perhaps feel they weren't at the table when the rules were written and have different views about, about water, uh, the kind of order that might suit them. But there are also you know, ungoverned spaces uh, and the, the two examples that spring to mind most quickly are, are cyber and, and space. And there's been quite a, bit of, quite a lot of work done in the cyber area, actually more rapidly if you look at the progress that has been made. Um, and I was just struck, you know, looking back at this 1991 speech, how, you know, how many years have elapsed and how, in some respects, how little progress has been made on this. But, but there's nothing like a sense of urgency uh, to galvanise the international community. And as a, as a diplomat, as a practitioner, Brian, I wouldn't be quite as pessimistic as, as you are necessarily, but I do think that sense of urgency needs to be beyond uh, meeting and negotiating rooms in UN settings. It's obviously got to be part of a, a broader conversation, not just a national conversation, but a, but a global conversation. And to have a global conversation, you need people to lead that conversation. You need uh, people who can help distill the arguments and explain them and create a sense that people have got a stake in the outcomes. And you know, that requires leadership, political leadership, lead thought leadership, you know, leadership on, on, on your part and, and the part of many others. So, um, you know, the fact that we're even having this conversation this evening now, it's not, not necessarily a, a typical random group of Australians at all, of course, but I mean, each, everyone here has probably got a role to play in that broader conversation and only then will we be able to galvanise it. And I, I suspect that the creation of our own space <coughs> agency, we did back in the late 1980s, to the mid-90s have a space, an Australian space office, of course. I'm very conscious of that. But I think that will encourage debate, at least in Australia. And we've always had the capacity as part of our diplomacy to, to be consensus formers. We won't necessarily be the ones who make it happen, but we can certainly be part of a coalition to make it happen. Excellent, uh, excellent points all there. Um, just before we take any more questions, does anybody want to make comments? a comment to picking up on the Secretary's uh, point, comments uh, in, in a way. Okay, there's one just in the middle, uh, one there first. Well, if I may, I'd like to comment on Professor Wheeler's assertion that law always uh, plays catch up. And I think outer space is one area where law was ahead. Um, my first involvement in outer space law was leading an Australian delegation on direct broadcast satellites, a subcommittee of the Outer Space Committee. And this was back in 1969 and 1971. And in those days, the concept of a satellite able to broadcast directly into a person's home was seen as a very, very long way ahead. Uh, yet the Outer Space Committee was looking at whether and to what extent that should be regulated. And of course, there were different views on uh, regulation of the media. Some states, including Australia, regulate media. The United States wanted free and open access. Uh, but one of my impressions of those negotiations, thinking back, was how professionally they were conducted. Even though it was in the Cold War era, there was very little political rancor, much less so than in many other later international negotiations that I was involved in. So I'd be interested to hear from Secretary Francis Adamson whether in current developments political rancour plays a major part uh, in our space law negotiations or to what extent they are conducted on a professional basis. You happy to Take that now. Uh, well, actually, what I want to do is call on my negotiator, Rob McKinnon, <laughs> uh, who has certainly up until now told me that they are being actually conducted in a reasonably positive spirit. But Rob, are you happy to just jump in there? Because I think it's, it's even more useful for, to hear from someone who's actually representing us at that intergovernmental group of experts. Sure. Well, uh, yes, yeah, so Robert McKinnon's my name uh, uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so, look, I, uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, if, if you look at the uh, at, at the places where this is, this is happening, indeed, I do think it is uh, uh, it's 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 both uh, professional without rancor, and indeed, it's one where uh, uh, the, the you know many of the you know the sort of 
the potential antagonists are actually taking a fairly uh, open-minded approach to, to what might be achieved, partly, I think, due to the fact that uh, uh, you know, some of these issues, you know, like if we look at, at uh, the uh, PPWT, uh, the uh, 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 Russian-Chinese uh, treaty, um, uh, it's been around for 10 years, so there's a, a lot of this, uh, uh, this ground has been, uh, has been uh, rolled over, uh, over often in that, in that time frame. But uh, uh, I do think there is um, uh, you know, a level of goodwill, and I do think we have some good benchmarks to, uh, to, to work off. I mean, if you think about the Outer Space Treaty itself, uh, you know, uh, at, at the, in a, in a slightly before the era you were talking about, uh, you know, that was achieved during a you know, very visceral uh, <coughs> part of era in the Cold War, uh, and yet uh, some remarkable uh, agreements were made. If you look at the, uh, the examples of the, uh, uh, of, of the, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, again, you know, that, that's, it, the, the global international community was able to achieve some, some again, some remarkable agreements on, uh, on, on a whole host of uh, you know, pretty important, pretty, pretty sensitive and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 important sovereign, uh, sovereign issues. Now, obviously, those things are under, under lots of pressure in lots of ways, but uh, you know, they provide good examples to us of, of what can be achieved almost uh, 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 in spite of the prevailing uh, uh, geostrategic circumstances, but you can't uh, uh, ignore the fact that those that those issues exist and that there are a lot of you know very important interests at play. And particularly when you look at, 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 at space issues, you clearly there's there's a lot of uh, uh, of areas that, that are going to be problematic because uh, countries won't want to have uh, you know, particular limitations on their freedom of movement in uh, in particular areas of, uh, of technology development, especially as it relates to uh, 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 to military-related uh, technologies. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is, um, uh, uh, yes, there is, uh, uh, there is still, uh, you know, clear, clear goodwill and an interest in trying to find ways through some of these, uh, some of these challenges, but we can't ignore the, you know, some of the fundamental uh, realities that it's not, you know, it's not going to be easy, um, but it's, uh, it, it's certainly not out of the question that we can make progress. And I think there was another comment in the middle. Justin, is it? Yeah, just here. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to agree essentially with, with um, comments that Secretary Adamson had, had made. There is um, often a level of disdain and cynicism about international law and normative frameworks. And sometimes it's the, the effect of the law is over, is both overstated and understated. Over, overstated in the sense that people sometimes seem to think that law is heaven sent, that it, it mm -hmm. uh, occurs magically. Um, uh, not that it's the product of compromise between states in, in diplomatic negotiations. But understated in the sense that, and this is where often the disdain and cynicism comes in, um, that it's of very little effect ultimately and states will do what they do. But, but the truth is it, it matters. It matters for getting UN Security Council resolutions. It matters for coalitions. It matters for basing rights. It matters for domestic support. And it matters for a short access to space as well. Uh, and again, agreeing with, with the point that you made about Australia's position, not only do we not have the power to to um, push for a rules-based global order in, in ways that other states might be able to, but we also don't have yet the means to uh, put space infrastructure up there and have space infrastructure of our own. Therefore, we rely on space infrastructure of other countries, and therefore, we rely on them playing nicely. Um, assured access to space and a rules-based global order is, is actually very important to us. The, the normative framework is also very important. People, again, may be cynical and disdain a rules-based global order, but even if um, some players don't comply, uh, in, in a military context, for example, one of the big problems in space is about attribution. Um, do we know whether something that has occurred in space was due to yeah. accidental reasons, space weather, for example, or something hostile? If most players comply with the rules-based global order, 
passing space, you know, getting to know what is normal behaviour and what is not normal behaviour becomes easier. So again, the, the rules-based global order is, is pretty important to us. And uh, over here. Uh, just a couple of quick observations. Um, I'd, uh, as an as a ex-DFAT law, the sea lawyer, I'd uh, respectfully suggest to Professor Wheeler that there are some uh, reasonably um, interesting developments in the uh, deep sea mining space around common heritage of mankind and also developed and undeveloped countries' uh, engagement in those fields um, to uh, draw on uh, in, the, uh, in the space of um, uh, uh, space. Um, I'd also like to say to Professor Anna Moore, thank you very much for your facility, um, uh, now to my current role as a, as a EU Delegation Science Advisor, um, uh, to say thank you for the role of the Advanced Instrumentation Centre uh, in uh, space environment testing of CubeSats, which took place in an EU-funded QB50 project, which was uh, referenced earlier. Um, and also there have been uh, earlier comments about the uh, EU uh, initiatives uh, in international negotiations. All that to say that uh, I'd of course welcome in the area of science and technology uh, a thematic uh, focus of the government uh, to engage with a number of uh, EU initiatives. Uh, there are a number of opportunities coming up uh, in the next few months uh, that would highlight that. Um, but what uh, we'd love is a little more uh, coordinated uh, cross-government approach um, where we uh, get uh, the host agency for the uh, space agency, uh, also supporting uh, space more broadly at the policy level. Um, and uh, I'd just leave it at that. Thanks very much. We might now do, um, I think, is take uh, just one last, uh, a few questions or comments, and then I'll come back to the panellists to, to wrap it up. Good evening. My name is Joel. Uh, I am an IT consultant. Group. Um, my question is for, for Francis and it relates to education and capacity building in space law. Um, high tech industries like the space industry come with increased regulatory complexity and therefore it's not enough just to invest and know the technology, uh, you must also have the capacity to understand and shape the regulatory agendas around these technologies. And considering this point, the UN has, has outlined uh, that space nations must educate and train professionals and governmental officials on the laws relative to outer space. And so my question is how DFAT currently does this, or whether it plans to enrol its staff into capacity building programs in order to upskill staff so uh, uh, they are proficient in the laws relative to outer space when it comes to diplomatic negotiations or sitting around standard settings tables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that sounded like a, uh, most questions are self-interested in some way or another, but look, I, I mean, the answer, the broad answer is, uh, at a very general level, is yes. I mean, let, let me first of all say, I mean, this is classically an area where we've got to think deeply as a government uh, about capacity building over the next, well, when you're thinking about capacity building, it's always good to think about it in a longer frame than you normally would, and that's one of the things that David Fodi's independent review of the Australian Public Service is, is actually focusing on at the moment. And we, as a group of, uh, well, in fact, the Secretary's board had a good session with him and his colleagues in Sydney on Friday just to talk about exactly this sort of thing, not specifically that, but, but I think your question was covered by our broader interests. In relation to DFAT specifically, you probably know we've uh, established, and this was a, one of many good ideas that my predecessor says of Peter Varghese uh, sort of set in train and that was the creation of a diplomatic academy uh, to train not just DFAT colleagues but from across the service in terms of uh, aspects of our international engagement. We have within that academy a law faculty as you probably know headed by the, by, currently by James Larson who's head of the uh, international law division in DFAT um, or the legal division in DFAT. I will need to check with him whether we're specifically focusing on this. You might want to give me your card uh, afterwards because you've obviously got some expertise in the area. I would say the answer is yes, we should be because of course you can't then get to the negotiation table unless you've got the technical knowledge 
to bring to bear. And we don't necessarily always do that ourselves. As you know, often these de de negotiating delegations have a wide range of experts uh, involved in them. So there are various ways of coming at it, but your essential point is a correct one. In the couple of minutes that we've got left, I think I might invite uh, Sally and Anna and then the secretary for any final comments. Sally? So, um, you know, in, in some ways, the idea of the sort of common heritage of, of, uh, of, of mankind, uh, I, I find quite endearing. Um, but I, I just don't think that commercial companies uh, that are going to be exploiting space on that level of investment, raising the level of capital that they need, are going to find it quite so endearing. So I do think that, you know, yeah. and that, that, that's where I struggle to see the, the analogy, I think. Because as states in, in an era of austerity retreat from financing this sort of stuff themselves, then, then that's what happens. The consequence is that commercial providers, uh, commercial operators are there and the risks to capital for them are very, very high. And it's, it's that that we need to deal with. Anna? Oh, uh, really just a real pleasure to be here uh, talking uh, some, about something much harder than what I usually talk about, <laughs> like going out and grabbing asteroids. Again. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, it's a real pleasure to be here supporting Sally and, uh, and Francis and what, uh, what we have to do on the, the more uh, regulatory side. Thanks, Anna. I think um, hard is a very much a relative concept when it comes to this. I don't know that I've ever been on a panel before with someone who builds satellites, so it's been a pleasure to sit next to you and, and also uh, to hear what Sally's had to say as well, too. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's a pretty challenging time, I'd have to say. I mean, I, I won't leave here this evening feeling that we've got this remotely covered. I will leave here this evening with you know, an even greater sense of urgency about the, the challenges that we're facing. I think, you know, Brian made a very good point. You know, technology is running away with us. Sally makes a good point about the, you know, the, the commercial aspects of it, which is just, you know, so tempting and, and already being taken advantage of. And of course, it's not just space, it's, it's Antarctica as well. It's, it's, it's a, you know, areas that we, we previous generations had thought were probably going to be okay and now suddenly, dramatically, you know, they're not. And I think that, puts an, an onus on all sorts of things, you know, domestic regulation certainly, but, but the sort of work that Rob and others are doing. And of course, although we, we do point bravely to examples where the international community have come together and, and done some very good things in terms of, of uh, the UN Commission on, on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, and you know, other examples as well. I mean, in our business, that is getting harder. There is no doubt about that. There are more countries around the table, more interest to be taken into account. Um, more at stake in a whole range of ways. So it puts a really big premium, uh, not just on diplomacy, but on, um, I suppose, you know, uh, the, the international community stopping and pausing and thinking before, before it acts. But uh, one can't be uh, hugely, hugely optimistic about all of that. I am an optimist by, by nature, uh, but I think uh, we've got to double down actually on some of these things because that the, the, the pace of them is, is quite dramatic. Just a final word on attribution. The question of attribution was raised. I mean, it's interesting, again, to refer to cyber. Uh, there's been a much greater willingness on the, on the part of a number of countries, Australia included, to um, uh, attribute um, malicious cyber activity. In fact, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister issued another media release on that uh, earlier today. Uh, it may be further off in space, but I think we're edging closer and that will need to become part of the rules and norms and the way we try to achieve responsible, uh, whether it's innovation or engagement with space. And before I hand over to Jeremy, I'll just quickly say to me, uh, yes, by nature I'm an optimist, but I'm not all that optimistic at the moment. Uh, not only about space, but more generally about the rules-based international order. And I see the alternative to a rules-based international order as being the worst possible option for Australia's future. So we must do more. It doesn't mean the rules-based order stays the same. It, of course, con always continues. But in that, where I think we have a deficit at the moment is 
And this will be interesting to see what comes out of uh, DFAT's soft power review. Uh, but I, since leaving the military, I've spent most of my life in civil society organisations. And I am always and constantly mesmerised by the deep passion, understanding and knowledge that exists in that. And so I really think we need to use our civil society organisations and our commercial enterprises far more than we have as a nation done in the past. We do it to some extent, and we do it better than some nations, but we don't go near enough as some other countries do, because by building civil society linkages right around the globe, we can really have a very positive influence, in my view, and DFAT's not resourced to do that at the moment. Um, and just two quick reminders. United Nations Day is the 24th of October, not far away, and there will be uh, events all around the country. And I think a really important date to remember is the 10th of December, which will be the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Even probably more important this year, given what's happening in the world and our standing on the Human Rights Council. <laughs> so with that said, Jeremy. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Jeremy Farrell, and I wear a number of hats which bring together the organisations that uh, have made this event possible. Uh, so I am an Associate Dean for Research at the ANU College of Law, where Professor Wheeler is my boss. Uh, I am also a member of the Centre for International and Public Law, uh, and my bosses are just over here, uh, Professor James Delios and Associate Professor Sarah Heathcote, so it's terrific to have you here uh, in the audience. I'm also a member of the ACT division of the United Nations Association of Australia, so I'm wearing that hat here and uh, representing the uh, President Brian Gleeson, who, as Mike mentioned, has been in PNG. And finally, I'm also the academic convener, or, or the convener of the academic network for the UN Association of Australia as well. So it's a real pleasure uh, to see these two organise, well, these multiple entities come together uh, to make this event possible. Uh, and it's my uh, privilege to give a vote of thanks to everyone who's been involved in making this event possible. Uh, so I might start by thanking all of the people behind the scenes, the communications and marketing team, uh, or teams I should say, both uh, at the UN Association of Australia, uh, in of course the ANU College of Law, and more broadly the strategic communications team at, at ANU. Uh, I'm grateful to all of the participants. Uh, I, I did want to sort of say two themes for me stuck out from the Secretary's uh, speech, uh, and I interpreted uh, so references to preventive diplomacy, the recalling the halcyon days of preventive diplomacy in the early 1990s. So I interpreted uh, the Secretary's comments to be something of a plea to us all to become, uh, you might want to call it, preventive space diplomats, uh, or perhaps uh, transparency and confidence building uh, diplomats in terms of space. So uh, I think this event is obviously, it's not the end, uh, it's the beginning of a really interesting uh, period of reflecting on these very important issues that have been raised uh, both through the Secretary's terrific uh, lecture and also through the, uh, the, com the contr contributions, the, the profound contributions that uh, discussants have made and also very much the participation from you in the audience as well. So uh, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, and before I close, I'd like to present uh, the Secretary with a, a small um, token of our appreciation for your Thank terrific you. distinguished lecture. Uh, it's a bottle of wine that's been produced by an ANU College of Law alumnus. Okay. So we hope you'll enjoy that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone.